Hi there, and welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the 1% Better Podcast and probably just trying to figure things out a little bit here because I'm recording audio for the intro to the actual show, but I'm also recording the intro on video. So doing a bit of both. Uh, I'll try not to make too many references for folks that can't actually see what I'm saying. But I haven't done an intro to the podcast for a while, so I decided to put this one together. Uh, this episode is 85, and it is with my guest, Adon Enright. So you might have checked out One Minute Monday earlier this week, on Monday, in fact. And Adon was my guest contributor for this week, and he uh, gave out some very sound advice that I would encourage you to check out on the, the website and the video page or on social it's been up since uh, since monday so just a few things to bring you up to speed on that's been happening over the last few weeks one piece of feedback or I suppose lots of feedback about one episode in the last month has been the isa nasiwa show and i was delighted to talk with isa back um, about a month ago and over the last few weeks as i said got lots of positive feedback he came across like a really sound guy which for the 15 or 20 minutes that i talked to him uh he certainly seemed and we've stayed in touch a little bit on email afterwards um so i would encourage folks to check that one out if you haven't already uh, it's it's interesting when you interview somebody another set of potential guests open up and i'm actually recording an episode this week with uh another person that's linked to new zealand uh he is a video analyst or was a video analyst coach for the all blacks for a number of years uh worked with them during the last two world cups so looking forward to recording that that's going to be an hour long one percent better show that'll come in a few weeks um if you haven't checked out any of the other 864s please do i actually did a live recording in front of an audience a few weeks ago with Stephen Ryan from Cork, uh, a marketing expert, and probably will release that one next week. Trying to do a one percent better and a, an eight six four alternate weeks at the moment. That seems to be the uh, the way things are happening. So that might come next week, and that was a a goal for the year to do at least one live audience recording. Um, up for more. It went really well. It was good fun and uh i'd like to do definitely more so if um if you know of any buddy that we could talk with or record with all ears to that all uh, right so what else are we talking about last week's one percent better episode was with the u.s reporter crime reporter melissa mccarthy and she has a memoir out uh, we did that episode a few weeks back but we also put it out on um on youtube and uh, we recorded it live so um, if you haven't checked it out go back to the website you can check out the the video recording and also the uh, the podcast melissa was kind enough to give us a free copy of her her book it's an audible book and i did a draw for that uh just about 10 minutes ago random obviously no no picking out names and uh from my subscriber list uh, the winner was Aoife Conway so congrats Aoife I have sent you an email with the uh, the code to download that so happy listening to that over the weekend um, what else have we got if you didn't check out which you mightn't have um, on International Podcast Day on the 30th of September uh, I did a session around podcasting uh, learnings from the podcast journey mainly focusing on Kind of areas of softer skill development emotional intelligence and uh, that's up on the site now if you ever wanted to, to to learn something about what you might actually improve on doing podcasting i'd uh, i'd encourage you to do it it's about 40 minutes long during it we hit some broadband gremlins which uh wasn't great when you're doing something live but we recovered and uh, i think it went okay in the end um so i mentioned the one minute monday check that out and I mentioned the 864 and some of the other 1% better recordings coming up. I put it on Twitter earlier in the week that episode 100 has been close to being recorded. Uh, I have a few more recorded that will roll out over the next few weeks, but looking for some new guests. And 
it would be cool if i had some suggestions or recommendations of who i could try and hunt down or maybe politely ask to come on to the show for episode 100 i guess it's a milestone uh it's a good number and we'll try and do something special for that maybe um so keep the suggestions coming in and i will see what we can do there not only about the 100 guests but just in general what's working well what's maybe not do these video things work uh, i'll probably put this intro video out on uh on thursday or friday the episode is going to come out on friday morning so see if i put this out online before then and um yeah we'll keep playing with stuff and it's certainly a lot of fun doing it and getting more comfortable with it it's a challenge get outside the, the comfort zone as i say and keep uh, trying to do new stuff and get better one uh, percent obviously at a time so uh, my only real asks are for the feedback maybe if you're enjoying the podcasts talk to some friends about it put it out in your own network in the social world uh, follow on any of the social platforms to try and help me grow the 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 reach and as always give me some ideas for for guests or or new questions or, or anything else that we could add okay so rambling intro nearly done this week is Adon Enright week as I was joking with Adon we had the one minute Monday and now we have the the one percent better podcast uh, he's somebody I definitely admire and and really have enjoyed following online and reading some of his stuff and he attended one of his seminars or one of his offsites earlier this year learned a lot from him he's in the coaching world human performance uh, self-improvement lines up very nicely with the theme of the the podcast and we talk about a lot of that uh, during the hour as well as Adon's background uh, where he's at now and, and maybe where he's going to in the future so okay I'll, I'll leave it there all in one take very proud of the seven or so minutes that i've rambled on so if you're watching please go to the full podcast uh it's on the usual places and if you're listening i'm going to stop talking and now you're going to hear from me and Adon. thanks so much have a great weekend good luck bye-bye hey folks welcome to another episode of the one percent better podcast and you might hear kind of more of an ambient feeling we're, we're in the studio uh, another person f sitting across from me uh, which is always good um, rather than just staring at a screen and that person is Adon Enright who is probably very well known to many of these listeners if, if they're in the Cork or region or in Munster and even in Ireland Adon thanks for coming in and looking Pleasure forward. to be here with you Rob. I know we were connected probably even before I started doing any of this but over the last year or so we've got to know each other a bit better and thank you for your your feedback and advice uh, I always ask people for feedbacks so you're, you're probably part of that one percent brigade <laughs> well that, it's, it's, it's good to be part of something <laughs> that uh that give it to me um and I'm yeah delighted I'm looking forward to, to to chatting with you over the next while about your journey listening to you I'm going to develop and practice the art of listening over the next while and uh, I think your journey is fascinating what stands out for me when I did my research and from knowing you and from going to one of your off sites and and definitely reading some of your posts as well there's a genuine there's a sense of authenticity of it I'm not trying to plumos you here now you're here okay, now you're so, doing great so yeah, far um, you're definitely uh, you strike me as somebody that would think deeply hmm. And what I really like about your posts is that they're very, very short. Mm. The brevity of it is uh, striking because I know as I'm sometimes doing articles and I'm 3,000 words in and I still haven't got to my point, I'm wondering how, how do you how do you get there? But um, would those words resonate with you? Is you think that's fair? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, or I, I do understand where you're coming from. A lot of that is a function of growing up. I guess, or, or getting old or maturing or g getting used to doing what you're doing. Um, there's a bit of a cliched phrase um, that does the rounds called finding your voice. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, uh, is happening a wee bit for me. So you, you get into any scenario where you're, you know, you're asked to say something or you do something. And after 20 times, you begin to understand some of it. After 50 times, some of more of it becomes clear after 500 times. 
pennies start dropping all over the place. So I think that's more or less it for me. There's no huge secret, only just iteration and, and practice and peeling the onion. There's another metaphor for you. But um, and I think that's what it is. And, and, you know, you just you gain confidence just to bring more of yourself into whatever you're doing, whether it's writing a piece or, you know, doing any bit of coaching work, whether it's with, with an individual or a group or whatever. You know, you're just bringing more of yourself into it. Mm. It's fascinating that you say it because I suppose even the the journey I'm on doing some of this, the confidence does start coming, um, but never in a, a way you think you've got it nailed. It's always going to be probably if you have a, a rampant internal voice kind of shouting <laughs> at you, that's always going to, going to be there. It just might get a little bit quieter sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we, we can't necessarily control the inner voice either. There are a number of things we can do to... Um, to get better at listening to it or or saying not no mister mm. or missus or whatever mm. um and yeah and i think the the only or the best thing to let's say to fight the the let's say the debilitating nature of the inner voice is just to to continue to you know put yourself in the the chair and and write whatever it is you you want to write or you know just to say yes to the chance to speak or you know whatever it is just to just to keep doing it which um at times it's easy just to to stop because we rationalize all manner of different things into you know oh i'm too busy or you know they're not interested or, or whatever but no i think it, it's important just to keep doing it mm. so the deep thinking piece fascinates me um and maybe this is where we kind of get into that little time machine going back w- was that something you were always uh, aware of or was it something that was always there kind of curiosity curiosity definitely um, I'm not sure about the deep thinking piece of it I think that that has come more with age and um, I, I, I I do know that you say it I do have these you're still a young man by the way you've mentioned oh, yeah, very age much. a couple oh, yeah, of yeah. times it's like, all, so. age is always relative <laughs> right, 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 okay. um, this, this idea of um, thinking about big questions. So I remember as a as a teenager, um, lying in bed, um, when Dave Fanning would be finishing his radio show. That's a real shout out for kids of the eighties now. Um, listening to, uh, or sorry, uh, you know, thinking about big questions. You know, why are we here? Um, you know, how did the universe start? So like before, I was ever exposed to any of the let's say the physics based explanations for you know the enormity of life and what it all means and death and all these kind of things Mm. you know i remember stewing on those questions um when i should really have been falling asleep and you know (laughs) doing things would be more useful for me that's like it's fascinating though i try to try to not ask the why questions sometimes because it can be defensive but but like why (laughs) what do you think actually was the reason behind that is is that something you're just born with do you think or hard to know hard to know i think the more you think the more you read the more questions you ask the more conversations you're involved in the more interested you become in all of those things so i think it's a thing that you develop whether you know whether you're there's an inclination there or not i don't know I'm not sure that that it's necessarily coming from any void or gap or any kind of post-traumatic thing. I'm not sure that that's the case for this. But, you know, you're just interested. You know, you're kind of following what, what's what's fascinating to you at any given minute. So, um, no, that said, I'm equally uh, likely to have been at that point kind of worrying about, you know, why Charlie Nicholas isn't playing for Arsenal or whatever, you know. Again, there's another 80s uh, moment yeah. for those of you who are around. That that is one of my questions. We're both we both share the Arsenal gene, I guess, and uh, I don't want to go to off in a t- total tangent. But w- w- where did that all originate from? That um, affliction. No, it's been great because yeah. I've been lucky enough to uh, live through a, a great times. But my fascination with football and Arsenal football club in, in particular uh, just came from a. a just a coincidence of, of being born at a time when they had loads of Irish players. Mm. So uh, they were the team to follow. And my father and my uncle were, were into it, having lived in London right. um, when they were younger men. 
and uh, I just got into it and Liam Brady and Dave O'Leary and all these fellas were they were the business back in 1978 mm. so that's when I really started to get into it and yeah now my my own son this one's uh-huh. really corny he's he's got into it as well not necessarily by my doing it was right. actually his uh, his mom bought him an Arsenal jersey for Good. his birthday a few years ago and I remember saying Jesus yeah, you're after putting all this uh, stress in this kid but uh, no he loves it he loves it there Very you go good. and that's I think when I you inter- in- interviewed Andrew Mangan yes on the Andrew, red chair a couple Club. of years ago yeah. and he was very kind enough to be one of my first guests as well and he, he kind of talked about where he came from and why he started it was around the same time I guess yeah. I think it was the 79 final or, right. or that Man United yeah. one um, no they didn't what we won three two. Oh yeah no that it was, oh yeah it was oh the, the united, united one, one. alright yeah, yeah. oh, no. you see the way I had to interrupt there that's <laughs> important it's going to be a fight there yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thankfully we're both our supporters um, so learning was then always a passion for you I'd imagine was it learning and growing up in school and did you have a, a um, grow for that I wasn't a big fan of school weirdly um, but I enjoyed reading Um some elements of school I enjoyed, some of the teachers I enjoyed, but I generally, the more time I spent in school, the less I liked it. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, you know, learning and school are, are intersected, but they're not necessarily the same thing. So, mm. um, but yeah, again, it, it's this thing of fascination, you know, what, you know, what's going on there, you know, what, you know, can you read about that or what's behind that or how does that work? You know, yeah. so it, it was those questions really rather than was it the- kind of structured stuff. The, the the school structure being taught versus kind of learning. You in school mm. you're kind of taught to memorize a poem, or it was very rote. A lot of a lot of that was was that one of the kind of potential. Pushes? Maybe it was. No, we didn't know any different, mm. right? So um, I didn't know any different. But you know, I, I think a lot of it was that some of the things in in school would be fascinating some of the things i had zero interest in and you just have this thing of having to do it and and you know trying to keep up or trying to make sure that you get whatever marks you need in the exams all this kind of stuff um and you know don't get me wrong it was they say school days are your happiest days maybe mm. we were maybe not it's, it's hard to know yeah but um mixed feelings i think mm interesting so where you're at now in your in your life and your mm. in what you do is different to what you did coming out of college from from, yeah, from doing dramatically different <laughs> from what I did my research here looking yeah. at you doing electrical engineering in UCC yeah what struck me was more process and analytical and left brain if there is yeah. if you buy into that versus I'm a lot more maybe creative world you're in now yeah but, Maybe talk to me about the choices that were made around then, or, or were you aware of where you really wanted to get to? Yeah, I, I yeah. There's a bunch of things actually there that are are, 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 are interesting. So yeah, no, there's a bunch of things. So you just a, a quick comment before I get into the 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 how it happened. It's funny. Every now and again, um, I get calls from people to do work with uh, you know groups in their organization, or you know that they're they have someone that needs coaching or whatever Mm -hmm. and they'll give me some element of like you're an engineer so you'll understand these people you know these these weird kind of funny shaped alien god help us those poor misfortunate engineers who have compromised social skills and all this kind of stuff right so um so it's standing to me and in that sense i think what what there, there was no plan I guess it is the the simplest way to describe, you know, why did things go in a certain way. Right. When I was in school, it was very much about conforming. Like I was interested in in physics. I was interested in maths. I was in, like that stuff was interesting to me. Mm-hmm. And what happened was the kids who got like the best marks in the uh, in their exams, you know, they were either going to be doing engineering or medicine right mm-hmm. i know this sounds corny now but this happened and um i was like yeah well i faint if i have to have a blood test right <laughs> right i literally keel over like I've, I've bruises all over me from um marks from from fainting but um 
Yeah, that's that's kind of how I got into the electrical engineering thing, which evolved into microelectronics, which involved into working in industry um, mm. with a kind of microelectronics focus, which evolved into more of a, a broader electronics focus. And then once I was working in industry, just started getting into um, different roles and so on. So just to draw comparisons, go on. like uh, I picked community psychology was my first choice in second. Is that right? But wow. um psychology in trinity and i i didn't do honors maths so i didn't okay. get there i missed out by that much so that was always what i really wanted to do mm. but i did communications in dcu dropped out after three or four months and then went and did it in galway because it was probably the up and coming thing and it was solid mm. that's that was kind of why i went that yeah, way but okay. but this sort of stuff was always there yeah um and it was a confidence thing i suppose it just took a long time timing True. again to get there but was that passion for you know interest and curiosity obviously there but there was you didn't look at kind of a course like psychology or doing something in those days no just didn't seem practical i was i was interested in it um i'm not sure that i would have ever seen it as a career path or mm. understanding you know that that was something that I could do. Right. Um, you know, it, you, at any given time, especially when you're younger, you, you tend to fall into a certain line of thinking or lines of thinking. And that just wasn't in my, my, uh, ra- or wasn't coming up on my radar or something I, I could do. But I was always fascinated. Even when, you know, I was doing various things in college or afterwards, I was always fascinated, let's say, on the application of these things in you know, in industry or in business, you know, how would this impact people? So I always had a, a bias towards the people aspect of things. Um, and it wasn't that it was not interested in the technical stuff, but, you know, it was always more interested in the application. So may, maybe that was a manifestation of it coming out, you know. Mm, interesting. Very, very good. So so when you came out of college, you came to EMC not too long after that was that fair to say yeah that's yeah. right 1996 so yeah. it was just as the the EMC um company was was really you know finding its feet and you know establishing itself in the market and it was expanding globally yeah so it was a good time to to get involved yeah. get involved in there and then as you spent a number of years there you've moved changed roles but you were starting to move towards people management I suppose it was yeah that's it that's it I suppose it's like anything when, when you're Large organizations, especially ones that are expanding or they're well run or they're, you know, where opportunities are coming up, you tend to gravitate towards the, you know, the opportunities that you're interested in, fascinating and so on. And that's generally what happened with me mm-hmm. was I just started to, you know, go more towards the stuff that for whatever reason was was fascinating, was interesting and, you know, without really getting in trouble trying to avoid the things that I didn't like. Yeah. So <laughs> that's kind of how that, that hmm. evolved. And um, yeah, so, you know, my, my, my I, maybe four or five different roles there over the course of 11 years and um, kind of went in. An engineer came out, a, um, uh, I don't know what, <laughs> someone who was trying to figure out a different way of doing things, I guess. But there you go. So over that seven or eight years, you were kind of getting... I'm talking about getting to know yourself or know thyself. And was that journey starting? Were you starting to kind of question, I'm, I'm, this is okay, but I, I have a real pull or a draw towards doing something different, you're, you know, building your plan B, ultimately coming out and doing what you're doing now. How did that build up and was there kind of starting turning points in it? I think the... the primary driver of that was focusing a lot more of my time and attention into understanding how people behave and why they behave in certain ways Mm. and you know understanding what performance is in a professional context and all of a sudden that became not just a a thing that was interesting but it became part of my job Mm. and the more that I got into that space of it the more I was fascinated by that and um, it was almost like, you know, when you were started going down that path that there was, you, you were just going to keep going on it. Mm. And whatever way I was going to be working in something that, that was in that field, it was just a matter of circumstance from there on, you know. So I think that was the, the turning point. So maybe when, you know, you have responsibilities to manage other people, managing in inverted commas, 
um, you know, I really started getting the zone in on, on that stuff. You know, in big organizations, they give you all this wonderful training and send you to all these fabulous places to to learn things. And again, you know, I'd be picking up on, on the, you know, whether it's the psychological stuff or the mm. understanding the, you know, the thought processes, the thinking models that people would or wouldn't use. Mm. And, um, you know, so that put me in that direction. The the other big thing that um, accelerated, I would say, that was back in 2003, I believe, EMC brought in the Six Sigma program, mm -hmm. which um very popular thing at that time in global industries. And they also did a lot of stuff on lean, uh, lean manufacturing, lean thinking. And I got involved with that early on. And I eventually, that eventually became my full-time job uh, doing that for the, the location here in mm. Cork. So um, that got me doing a lot of uh, training workshops, a lot of mentoring, mm. a lot of one-to-one -one stuff. And that kind of gave me that communication muscle, mm -hmm. let's say, to, you know, to fire myself towards the direction of the work that I'm doing now. So. Mm. Was there a point then where you said, I have to move out of this environment and chase the, the passion, chase the dream full time, that break point. What, what was that day like or was it a, a waking up one morning and saying, right, I got to do this? It was, <clears throat> it was kind of a process, but it was short enough. Like any time that someone chooses to leave an organization, there is a combination of pull factors something outside is is attracting you mm -hmm. and there's some push factors so there's something you know that's bugging you and uh, that just doesn't fit right and it just happened that around that time there were some pull and push things like naively and I, you know i've said this before like naively um i honestly thought that i could do the kind of stuff that i was doing in terms of training and um you know mentoring and all that I, I'm not so much that I'm so good at it, but I could easily do this in other organizations. Though I was involved in a few other bits outside of work mm. that was giving me exposure into other organizations and so on. And uh, I said, I could do this. You yeah. know, and I, we were hiring in a lot of consultants and trainers. And um, we just got this craziness to think, yeah, you know, you could do that too. Mm. A lot of the people who um, were giving me feedback at that time were giving me a lot of positive feedback on that stuff mm -hmm. and you know if there wasn't positive feedback it was coming from other areas so again this kind of mm. natural human um, <laughs> reaction to kind of move towards the pleasure and away from the pain yeah so that's what um, kind of put me in, uh, in the mindset that hey you know you could do this yourself that craziness that uh, you know launched me to to go out on my own which I eventually did in 2008 and 2008 was probably unbeknownst to you a tough time <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. jump back like that's 10 years ago right was, now yeah. looking back yeah. how how did you find that adjustment and were those what you say craziness ideas were they actually crazy were they was there a, a ramp up period how, how did things start to evolve there i suppose a, a big learning curve i'd imagine uh, very much so and, it, and it, it, it never ends really i'm being facetious with the craziness but I would say the the best description is naivety. Right? Right. So you have a certain amount of exposure to what's going on, but the thinking it through. Now that's a phrase I often use in coaching. You know, have we thought this through? You know, so what's what happens if we do this, and then what might happen? No, there's we can never predict mm. um, what's happening. There's a lot of circumstantial changes, unintended consequences, all this kind of stuff. But I did not. Um, think it through fully you know I was working on an idealized vision of what could be um, I ha absolutely had not factored in the fact that the, <laughs> the economy would, would tank within a few months of me uh, stepping out and that you know training budgets were being cut everywhere mm. um, so I very much had to kind of scrappily reinvent myself a little bit and weirdly as well which wasn't wasn't useful for me I more or less dropped all that lean and Six Sigma stuff mm. because I had when I was leaving that was my my thought was that I would you know be an independent provider of those kind of things mm. but uh, I kind of shook that off within months right and um, which again you know <laughs> you were advising someone else you go whoa what's going on here 
but it was the start of of kind of reinventing things or figuring out my own way of doing it and um even though short term that meant that you hadn't a clue what you were doing and it meant that you mightn't have been working when you could have been working on stuff that you could do mm. um so it just took a wee bit longer to get there but i think you know it's just it was just the way that it that it happened for me back to the voice in the head then i suppose mm. how did you deal with that him or her at that time i suppose great coming in yeah great question so i to be uh i was very lucky to have a very active uh, post facto rationalization voice where i'd always justify something that didn't work as oh there was a reason for that and it wasn't necessarily because i sucked at it hmm um even though that may have been the case now it's always <laughs> you know like our contribution to anything whether it's a success or a failure or somewhere in between it's never all about us it's always to the you know it's a combination of of things at any given time but um i think i was lucky as well in that because of the time when i did uh, set up my own thing i had come into it with a level like I, I wasn't under pressure financially in the sense that you know I I didn't need uh, to to earn a certain amount of um quite every month to pay the bills I had a certain cushion um which is maybe good or maybe bad there's pros and cons to it for mm. sure mm. but it meant that I was able to experiment with stuff and kind of give myself a bit of a looser um leash in terms mm. of doing that so I no, don't get me wrong. There were times where I would not get out of the bed. Right. I was entirely exasperated. Mm. Um, I just didn't fancy it. Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. certain days, but um, yeah, but like they, they were thankfully few. Right. So you know, I was. I always had a certain momentum. I had, there was always stuff going on for me in terms of various projects I'd gone on, and you know, I tried so many things in the first few years. Uh, almost like if you plant enough. Seems. things in the garden you know you'll get a few decent spuds and a, a few good carrots you know um, and what kind of came up for me there is you're talking a lot about you dealing with your own internal yeah. dialogue how did you and, and it's interesting what you do a lot of now around building networks and mm. collaboration did you reach out to others to help you through some of those stages and, and collaborate with to, to kind of help you evolve how, how important was that did to a certain extent but it, it took me a long time to get good at that and right. the key let's say that let's say the key uh, learning for me was when i was doing my executive coaching uh, diploma in smurfett in ucd yeah. the that process so i went into that thinking oh this is great now this is another you know, string to my bow. This is like the kind of thing that a guy like me, you know, kind of a sharp, <laughs> you know, suited corporate type guy. Right. Oh, I can do coaching. I can do this. I can do, you know, I can do everything. Right. But what I underestimated going into that was the personal development side of it. And the fact that getting into coaching would it, not so much require you, but it, like it, it means you walk through a process of questioning, of discovery that I wasn't, not so much what I wasn't ready for, mm. but it definitely threw me back in my arse in terms of thinking, whoa, you know, re, re, so the way I was thinking before, was that the only way? And of course it wasn't. Right. So that was very useful for me. And um, that also gave me a network of peers who were going through that process mm. that allowed me to you know, have conversations about, you know, what's going on. That said, I was still very much a, how's everything going? Going great. You know, mm -hmm. I've done this and blah, 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 blah. So it was very much a kind of a lead with everything's great. Um, but, you know, you could get into um, proper conversations about the the adventures and mm. <laughs> in doing anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Definitely the, the coaching, I did the diploma with IMI, so, yes, and that's brilliant. only just a couple of years ago, the, you, you're 10 years there, yeah. but but the the journey through the, that with the 30 or so people in there and the opening up and the sharing and yeah. that that was We're not was used amazing, to it. Man. I mean, it, it is, or at least it was for, for me, um, like, 
oh my god what's going on here you mm. know the, it's it's not the kind of thing that you normally have in a workplace mm. and uh, it takes a bit of getting used to but the value of it is immense yeah and i think that though sometimes like anything when you get used to something you quickly forget how you weren't used to it right so true not too long ago and by the way that curse of knowledge thing mm. like i'm so long working in this space now mm. that there are times that people come into let's say our offsite environments or whatever and i have to remind myself you know remember this might be this first time that if someone has ever been asked the question you're about to ask them yeah and the fact you know the prospect of them talking about something yeah and someone else looking at them <laughs> you know like not all of us are in a in, in a self confident state to to talk openly about whatever they're thinking about you know yeah and it's even interesting even just putting together some materials of doing presenting about yeah. core values and whatnot okay. like it's it's um it it it's that internal debate to say this is very rudimentary i won't even include it right but but you you're obviously making the assumption others do it's it's challenging almost then because you don't want to go in regurgitating something in front of people and you're almost then saying oh the, the you know you, you will your own self-reflection will say no, I'm, I'm being nothing new coming out here yeah versus, and you want you know, to you want to you know play your best cards yeah, right i mean that's yeah. a totally natural human thing to do you want to impress yourself nearly mm. but uh yeah we do have to remember that you know we're all at different stages of everything mm. and um you know it's, it's okay just to remind ourselves of of the the basics so to speak yeah and uh, to do it in a way that that is okay for everyone so that's a tension that's a challenge within any kind of guidance any kind of um environment like that for sure so the coaching diploma uh, breaking down you your sense of self self reflection self awareness yeah. the eq world probably was yes. that really the like was eq something you were familiar with before doing a lot of that it was it yeah. was um i remember one of the the books you know we're, we're given like 10 books at the start of the, mm. the course and i was like yes goldman is uh on the curriculum brilliant ready, i love it so um you know you had this sense of yay you know i can get into this properly so it was but through my through my own reading or, or exploration or even you know some of the the courses or workshops or various things you do um it was and and i could see that that was an underappreciated element of you know performance yeah simple as that simple as that it, it is an underappreciated element and i think that's still the case today that we're only still catching up collectively as professionals to the significance of of emotions but also our intelligence in terms of dealing with the emotional component of the work we do mm. so coming out of that then did you did that put you on a, a, a different direction a different path did it change your your view your where your mission your your vision was those things kind of forming as a result of that it do you know what it did so let's say there was a kind of a short-term path and long-term part long term it put me on the road to the work i'm doing today mm. but short term it confused me okay. because what i had then was i had a bunch of things that i was trying to juggle um a lot of them were external in terms i had i had this thing i could do with people i was doing in various bits and you know often companies or clients or individuals would ask me what is it that you do mm. and i'd say i'm not sure right. no i wouldn't say i'm not sure to them <laughs> i would say that internally yeah. and they would say oh i do this I, I, you know blah 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 but it was confusing and if i didn't understand it then how could anyone else and that's that's one of the the things that I, I'm still juggling with, but it's a, a truism of, of every thing that any of us are doing. Mm. If we don't, if we're not clear about what it is we're trying to get across, and even in just in a face to face or in anything, mm. then how can someone else do it? Why, why would we expect someone just to be able to intuitively? sense and get uh, what you do which by the way some people did anyway for mm -hmm. me right yeah, so yeah. they could just you know they'd be hearing the, you know they'd be looking at the stuff that i'd be sending them or i'd be they hear me rabbiting on and they got it mm. they got it you know but a lot of people didn't developing the ability to to, to say no to something then was that something that came along or, around then because if somebody hypothetically said rob can you do this project management 
contract I would probably say I can but maybe it's not the thing I want to to do um but you might just say yes anyway so did you is it something you developed is it something you're more confident about now saying no to certain things and yes to others I'm pretty good at it now mm. but I wasn't very good at it for a long time so there were there were a couple of things driving that one was the ego satisfying thing of someone asking you to do a piece of work and you saying um yes i can i can do it now it might be a little bit outside of your comfort zone which is fine mm-hmm. um but it would bring you into a lot of unexpected scenarios where you know you couldn't be sure that you could deliver to the quality that you wanted or it brings you into scenarios where you're like oh no i hate this kind of job but we've started it so i have to finish mm. and that so i'm much sharper now on on uh, on the elegant no kind of saying that that is not uh, the best or rather you're not going to get the best of me doing that you're better off uh, working with someone else or mm. some other entity or whatever yeah and so that takes time but that takes time because you know sometimes you're driven like for example there would have been times when you know i expanded the the business and i did a whole host of things with smart reg where there was a lot of bills so the people needed to be paid there was a lot of stuff going on and there were times where if the phone rang and they said look will you come in and do this and i'm looking at the ins and outs for the next three months in the accounts or whatever I was driven by Jesus I need it you know so like there's always different dynamics going on but um, yeah I'm beginning to get pretty good at that now (laughs) you're about to if you're about to test that please don't (laughs) you said yes to this so So you mentioned Smarter Egg the name the the process you went through I'm always fascinated by brands and Mm. trying to come up with them I think I mentioned in the notes I sent the rub of the green thing for me yeah uh, just to compare I couldn't think of some a name for it but a friend of mine actually suggested it and then I said that just fits it just felt right you know so sometimes certain things feel right but can take a long time to get there was that the case with Smart Reg was there I'm just fascinated about the process that you used this, the, yeah the Smart Reg name came very quickly actually and right. it was motivated by uh, what wasn't out there already hmm. so I wanted I like this idea of having you know like smarter eggs so like um clearer process or whatever you know that kind of structure the two-word structure and um just literally brainstormed a bunch of things it was kept checking on online does this url exist anywhere in the world mm. smarter egg like that as a phrase existed you know yeah. is smart eggs or whatever yeah and then it was kind of descriptive that you know you get involved in this and you become you know, a smarter egg, whatever. It's a one percent smarter uh, Rahav or whatever, um, and it's stuck. And as you've seen it, like it, it, over the years, then it allowed a little bit of flexibility in terms of using the mm. the concept. You know, with like these egg characters, and Brilliant. you know that they're they can then express all the range of human emotions and all the different scenarios that we go through in our professional lives. So, yeah. um, you know, it's a versatile kind of thing without getting into yeah, <laughs> much yeah. kind of branding uh, cliches but, but the versatility probably wasn't something you talk, thought Not about at all no it just <laughs> yeah. it sounded like great uh, or it, it kind of no that said there was a slight um, downside to it at times because it kind of sounded or at least a couple of times people say it sounded a little bit cocky like you know we're smarter eggs you know we're kind of smarter than you which was mm. never the impression mm. or never the intention. Yeah. But look, there's nothing perfect. Yeah, no, that that wouldn't have been a an angle I would have ever yeah. taken. You yeah. know, it's just funny. You would think you'd over you'd end up overthinking certain things, oh, and yeah. yeah, but but that's certainly not yeah. one that would would have come up for me. So that that's been evolving and growing. You've done the the red chair series. If you <laughs> if you look back, that's still going, right? Oh like yeah, it's part it of, is. Yeah, so it's it's still like you have the red chair, but it, they're the kind of smarter egg events effectively. Mm-hmm. Like so, looking back over the the ten years mm-hmm. you've been doing it, what are the I suppose two questions? What are the biggest successes you've had so far and again how you define success is right you know to, to you what what stands out from that and maybe what you learned the most from th- that success okay um i think that the single or at least as i'm sitting here now speaking to you the thing that that gives me the greatest sense of 
satisfaction that I would say that is successful is the creating the environment for lots of people to plug into to give them uh, a capability to work on themselves and work on whatever it is is going on in their professional lives in their business their organization their career whatever and to have spent a lot of time thousands of hours brick by brick sometimes building a tall building sometimes crashing them down sometimes building different kind of bits right but to have built up that infrastructure that um, call it ecosystem mm. which has enabled several hundred people to to progress as a result of it i mean that's the that's the ultimate thing that that uh, i get satisfaction from mm. and that's taken different forms um over the years but i mean ultimately as of now as a result of all that work there is a community of people who is some many of whom are actively involved on a on a week to week basis in, in the various things that we do and, and there are others then that are dipping in and out depending on on, on it and there are others then who have you know who are, who are no longer involved in what we're doing but as a result of what um the experiences the conversations the challenges the things they picked up are you know doing better so that that that's the number one mm. thing no i i realize that's an abstract thing because like within that then there is multiple you know business offerings that yeah. that have succeeded mm. but um if you don't have the overall thing you know why are we doing this you know it's it's to do that it's to give people that that mm. support mm. no it resonates and i think it's like the ecosystem is a great word for it right because yeah. there's so many i don't know tentacles to it <laughs> and that's probably bringing in another type i don't know what, what uh that's an octopus type and yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> the, the, the flip side of that then is uh, always good to to ask of what i'd like to ask is that if there's a, a the biggest faux pas or mistake you've made during the years that that you've learned the most from yeah your show your show isn't long enough brother. <laughs> <laughs> just one <laughs> okay the okay there's been so many i think if though without getting into naming specific things uh because some people are going hey i was involved in that um i would say anything that that overreached in terms of not so much its ambition so i would say over the 10 years i've made three and a half attempts at expanding scaling the business in ways that i felt at the time were the right thing to do or at least that a lot of people are saying you should do and for various reasons they just weren't the right thing to do so some uh, failed because they they just weren't the right um set of offerings and it wasn't going in the right direction which was used for learning which has now been inculcated into the various things we're doing so none of it was a waste and then other times it were just like the wrong collaborations short term okay long term not so good um but i think the common element through all that is just this thing of overreaching so you step outside of what you know to be true what you know to be uh, kind of congruent about what makes you work well with all the other things that go around that you know can you sustain this over a period of time and you start moving into the oh you know people are expecting us to do this or we should be doing this or Mm. you should be going global you should be all this kind of crazy stuff Mm. um which lots of people kind of cheerlead but um they're not there then to um to kind of you know put out the bins the following (laughs) monday morning you know so yeah that would be it cool like a few questions came up from you while you were answering that one which is always good feeling and an intuition there like certain times i know i do i'm doing something and it doesn't work out and and, and I, I know back i look back and said like it was screaming at me that wasn't going to work out you said there you felt they were going to work out but but they didn't and is that something you've developed more of over time a, a sense of i just trusting the gut in a way you do, big time i'll give you a great example of that rob there was like as i say i've done multiple collaborations different things over the the years in various forms and i remember there was i'm thinking of one example where i was doing stuff with one person which led to doing stuff with another couple of people and it was really exciting stuff and it was at the cutting edge of what i thought was possible in terms of 
you know different ways of, of coaching and, and developing mm. people but my wife made an observation one night she said you're always frazzled after your interactions with that person mm. and I was like whoa what's that about now and she was right you know um, it was emotionally all over the place so it was exciting but it was also a lot of like churn you know and like she'd even come and Jesus you're you're waking up early or whatever and you know there, there's like if we're only focusing on a particular piece of ourselves which might be let's say the the intellectual rational brain element where I could see you know all manner of exciting things but I wasn't listening to to me yeah. I wasn't listening to you know, I was going on emotionally, like I was having a visceral, physical reaction where like, you know, tummy would be gurgling, blah, 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 blah. You know, you just feel just totally weird. It was like, you know, you're yeah. after playing a, a hard 90 minutes without the um, <laughs> or 70 minutes or whatever, <laughs> puck and ball. Um, you know, it was just just weird. So the, all um, data, whether it's visual whether it's on a spreadsheet whether it's in the gut mm. whether it's you know emotional stuff it's all valid and needs to be listened to and respected mm. you know so that that would be my my learning from that yeah and it's interesting that your your wife identified it yeah the question then that comes up for me there is the the need for having a coach yourself yeah and having that outlet like i would even say to paula sometimes if she would notice you might go and talk to somebody in relation to the stuff you're juggling with. And, yeah. and as you know, as a coach, if you're talking to taking on board an awful lot of stuff from people all the time to outlet it, is that something you have always regularly done in, in the kind of maintenance mode yourself? Very much so. Um, you need to have, you, you, well, one of the things I've learned both um, from going through the coaching process myself, but also just from life, mm. is that you are better off when you are verbalizing the stuff that's not being verbalized, if that doesn't confuse you. So it's important just to, if there's something on your mind or something bugging you, there's stuff that keeps coming up, you've got to get that into a conversation somewhere. And I think one of the things that I've been lucky enough to, to build, just because of the nature of the professional work that I do, is that I have a, an amazing support network of various people in different uh, areas of, of the, the professional coaching space, but also just, you know, people who have, who are out there doing various bits that I can have a conversation uh, with on any given topic. Mm. And it's fantastic. No, we didn't have that mm. sometimes. And there were times when I would have stewed on particular things for months, you know, mm. and I would be, you know, it would kill you nearly. But um, but it takes time to develop that. And I think this comes back to the, the essential value of any coaching intervention, which gives you someone to have a conversation with. It gives you external eyes on, on your situation. Mm. And it's a reminder to you that there isn't only just one way of thinking about it or seeing it or feeling about it. And, we, you know, we can our tendency is to get locked into that. Mm. You know, So that's yeah. the value of it not only coaching as a kind of a support I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs on the show and they said the one thing that they learned as they're gone is, is to realize they can't do everything themselves and when to bring somebody else in be it a financial expert or marketing or whatever during the 10 years is that something you've learned be to become better at and know definitely. when to delegate definitely and i would have been a seriously bad offender in this regard <laughs> and it's the thing of pride you yeah, know, it's yeah, yeah. a thing of pride. It's also that, that classic fixed mindset thing, the Carl Dweck uh, idea that, you know, you, you see, not so much as you see yourself, but you want to be seen to be operating at a level where you have all your shit together and you know the answers. But of course you don't. Mm. And it is having that, that um, courage to say, you know what, I need help with this or I haven't a clue what I'm doing here. Mm. Um but that takes time too. And at least for me, it took a long time to to kind of break down that resistance to just saying, hey, look, I need help with this. Or, you know, if, if I'm going to do this successfully, I, I need someone else to do it. So, you know, some people struggle with that. I know, I know. And it, like there's a bigger element of that in terms of this whole idea of delegation within within teams and groups and organizations. But it's so important. Yeah. You know, and you, you always come back to it. 
if you're the kind of person that resists doing that you would always come back to it yeah mm-hmm. interesting and again another kind of spin-off question here the amount of roles you have like you're mm. you have some personalities i'm sure within the business or just different things <laughs> you do you you interview people you you know you're, yeah. you're a host in that respect you're a facilitator is there any role you you enjoy most the gosh that's a great question i think the thing that gives me the greatest joy or the greatest uh, excitement when i'm doing it is at the intersection of the coaching work itself whether it's with a person or an individual i should say or with a group let's say in the, the kind of the offsite type um environment and the design of something around that so it's understanding you know what's useful here and coming up with something that that would work so it's that intersection of the design of of the solution and the actual contact with the person or the group or whatever it is and is that something that you've kind of landed on more so over the last while that that you got to know yourself better that that's the one that emerges the best it is and and there there would like for example it would have gone through cycles of uh, time thinking that oh the last thing i need to be doing now is actually doing the work because I can't scale my hours, you know, I'm going to design all this stuff and, you know, let all these other people do it. You know, all this kind of stuff that you go go through, um, <laughs> or at least I have done cycles of this kind of stuff. But, you know, you realize what, what is it that gives you the greatest satisfaction? And essentially, what are you best at as well, which is another important, <laughs> essential thing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think I've realized that, that over time. Um, I've always ha- also had a problem of doing the same thing twice, which mm. I realize is actually very inefficient financially. Mm. You know, the ability to, like, for example, do the same talk twice, right. which I did last week, which is a huge thing for me, because normally I would custom everything. And it's crazy because, mm. you know, I'm spending way too many hours working on something. But uh, so I managed to do I had two different speaking gigs last week and I did the same talk. Um and it was great and why because you, it worked <laughs> were you saying that to yourself I can't do this twice because I'm not being original it's coming back to the thing we were talking about earlier yeah, about yeah. this thing of um, I don't know you're tr- you're trying to exactly yeah Jesus, I've said that before Outload being so, inauthentic to yourself almost or yeah, something yeah but like you know like, yeah, I've said that already so you know it's it's not perfect if it hasn't been said before it doesn't have value you know this kind of craziness yeah. but um, yeah so I, I've as we're growing up slowly Rob we're learning these things <laughs> which are, is obvious in hindsight or external eyes would say of course you should have yeah. you know a few things that are very very simple to explain and sell you know but there mm. you go very cool I attended your session in April in mm-hmm. Gary Vaux the one day session a day of, of reflection which, right. which I, I fully enjoyed uh, as somebody that likes to do that um, your approach for, for those every quarter i suppose you take a topic is there a kind of a, a approach that you take for each one do you kind of design that within on a quarterly basis looking at a specific area is that how you work with that yeah so it, it, the answer is yes and right so th- those quarterly offsites that we run every offsite kind of follows the same high level process of reflection assessment adjustment commitment okay and it's done in a collective environment where there are other people there that are coaching you but also holding you to account uh, for the 90 days after so what also happens though on top of that is depending on the time of year or whatever there will be a theme or themes that is Mm. going through that work over the course of the day that is relevant to that that time or mm. is something that that needs to be done like so for example at the start of the year you might be looking at the the year ahead from a complete perspective and you might be kind of going up uh, a few uh, thousand feet you know and looking at some of the really big things for example in the autumn offsites which we're we're in the middle of, of doing now it's more of a focus on the next three months so we're using a lot of the essentialism themes mm-hmm. and and nudges to to remind us of you know what's what are the vital few you now that we need to concentrate on for the next few weeks so it, it comes and goes depending on mm. on context okay and over the last number of years people probably seem to be in, in our world getting more and more interested in self-development and 
the whole idea of waking up a little bit more. Have you noticed that over the last number of years? I have, yeah, because I noticed, like, you know, if I'm 10 years doing this out and about, I've noticed that the percentage of people who avert their gaze when you start talking <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. has steadily gone down. Mm. And it's not unusual now to go into a room of, let's say, even 15 people in a, in a corporate group or 100 people at a conference or whatever. And for hardly anyone to avert their gaze, you know, they're ready to listen. Mm. And there are multiple reasons behind that. But yes, I have noticed that people are more open to exploring a slightly different way of working. They're more open to expressing themselves. They're they're more open to being themselves in a work context, Mm. which is only good. Mm, Definitely. And even bringing in mindfulness and meditation yeah. even mentioning that into in the corporate environment which i yeah. try to do sometimes has certainly got much more traction than it has five or six years ago oh for sure you, you're yeah. a complete weirdo uh, a few years ago and mm. uh, no there are some people that are rolling their eyes if you mention that stuff still but i think the numbers are going down and i think it's a good thing mm, very good we're coming up to 55 minutes which is coming close to the hour as as you would imagine um so we'll uh, <laughs> okay. we'll do just a few more i'm pretty good at maths uh, <laughs> okay. the, the, the time the time flies when we're certainly having fun i'm having fun here maybe just to wrap up with a few maybe practical questions okay. that you can impart some of your your knowledge and okay hopefully becomes wisdom for for others in their in the kind of one percent better mindset see if there's stuff that you could maybe that you practice that others could could do um Goal setting. How do you approach goal setting? Good question. I've tried a lot of things over the years. I've tried a lot of techniques. Um, nothing is ever stuck, I have to say, Ron. Mm. Nothing is ever stuck. What I like to do is I'm, I'm very much a project based person in terms of I kind of run my life through projects. So mm-hmm. I'll have particular projects that are, are short term, I have ones that, you know, are. are have a, have a longer term focus so within that I'll have priorities so what I tend to do is um, focus on calendar stuff so for example you know what's important to me this quarter so you know what do I look to achieve so I'll have certain targets around that on a daily basis I'll, I'll try to get a particular set of things done mm-hmm. some of those are what I would describe as sustaining activities just you know stuff that makes me operate at my best and then other things are things to move the needle forward on a particular project and then you know there are other things that are just delivering whether it's a coaching session you know or I'm doing a, a gig or whatever it is there's so many different bits um but I don't know if that answers your question yeah, but no. it, you know but as of now I don't necessarily have my goal list with the five things on it I just I, I use all of that good stuff through the lens of projects do you use any tools or anything that you use to to manage all of that i do so i'm a huge uh, fan of the getting things done system the david allen gtd system so i use this um cloud-based software called nosby it's Mm -hmm. developed by these uh by folks in poland which is based on the gtd system so that's how i drive my ship (laughs) is, uh, is using that system so that as i say it's based on you know there's certain projects which have actions and then you know that bubbles up into categories okay. so like I've, i would have a coaching category i would have a speaking category out of a smarter egg yeah um category so you know that's how i mm. keep the show on the road that's an interesting one yeah i can mm. you've trello have you heard of trello? i have indeed we kind of live off trello yeah and no, i i saw your board there in the background <laughs> it's kind of in the way there um i always love having a list of especially like even though i knew you were coming today Mm -hmm. and this was going to happen i never move it to the done kind of column until it's actually happening because it just feels good straight afterwards that's kind of that (laughs) that's dopamine isn't it it is coming out there yeah it's a good thing how have you learned to rebound or or get over a bad day or a bad session or something that didn't go well what are your kind of techniques to to revert back into a positive state anything come up I have a bunch of things there actually Um, I'm going to give you my friend Neil O'Brien's answer on that first before telling you about my situation Neil talks about resilience being more about the habits we keep rather than any attribute 
And I think he's bang on there. If we're looking after ourselves physically, if we're looking after ourselves mentally and emotionally, our ability to withstand ups and downs mm. is much better. So it comes down to the to the almost the, the daily discipline of doing the right thing. What I found over the years is that uh, two things, conversations about these things. Uh, every now and again, something crazy happens. Um, unexpected, good, bad or indifferent. And I find having a conversation as fast as I can with someone in my support network is essential. And would you believe, coming back to something you just raised, it was made a massive difference to me is meditation. Mm -hmm. So the ability to just calmly put things in perspective, no matter what it is, you know, it is what it is right now. Um, just trying to deal with it that way. David Allen, the getting things done guy, has has a lovely metaphor that he uses, this idea of mind like water. Mm -hmm. And the idea there is that just think of, of a lake in like a nice placid lake, you know, where there's no serious uh, waves or any choppiness. And if you throw in a very small little pebble, there's just a tiny little ripple. Mm -hmm. And then if you throw in a huge rock, then there is, you know, substantial waves and there is an appropriate response of the water to, to what happens. And that as a metaphor is superb because it reminds you, OK, sometimes big things happen, but a lot of the time we make the little pebbles into big things mm -hmm. and we're responding as if a huge rock went, went in but it's of no use to us so that's been helpful in terms of putting all those things in perspective mm. meditation so just on that is there your your first dipping the toe in the in the lake uh with it what what, what was what what was the the point where you started to feel a benefit from that was there any technique or you know, there's so different types, but yeah, it, works for you. It, it took a while uh, to feel the benefit of it. I, I, I just noticed after a few months of doing a few months, by the way, mm -hmm. of doing a kind of a daily practice. I was using the Headspace app for a couple of years, which was very useful. Mm -hmm. Um that I just had that, you know, going back to the mind like water a metaphor that there was a more appropriate <laughs> ripple effect, depending on what was going on. I was noticing that I, my kind of, the gap between, to use this this well known phrase, the gap between the stimulus and response was widening, mm -hmm. um, and it was from just that kind of daily practice of doing, even if it was ten minutes. I tried to do fifteen. Some days I don't do it at all, mm. and maybe I've got complacent. Do you the, notice the longer those that days do it. that you might have a like? I notice if I don't, I, I, again, it goes back to what you were saying about habits mm. and the two or three things I have to do every morning. It's almost OCD at this stage, but mm. the days I don't do those, I feel like I'm off center a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's Funnily enough, when it comes to meditation, I don't notice a, a short term effect in the same way I would if I didn't exercise. You know, if I hadn't been out with the runners on for a few days, I'd notice it. If I hadn't been to the gym for several weeks, I'd notice it. Mm. But with the meditation, it seems to have just a, a longer half life for whatever reason. But the other piece of it is that I've tried to adopt various other kind of mindful ways into what I'm doing. If I'm walking anywhere uh, uninterrupted, I just, you know, focus on my footsteps for a while using my friend Hugh, who uh, yeah, I don't know yeah. his mindful walking stuff. Um, and there's a bunch of different things that I would just, you know, just bring myself back to the moment. So it's not just all about the, the sitting or the, the formal practice. It's just using that that approach in a, a bunch of different ways. Hmm. this one is a bit maybe out there but i'll ask it anyway what's the last thing that you might have learned or taken on that stands up or stands out that that has lit you up like that it was a wow <laughs> i'll tell you there's something very specific um because i was stuck uh working with a particular coaching client on a challenge they had and it came from material that I had used previously there are these two guys based in Stanford University whose names have just gone right out of my head Rob um, but they have a whole set of materials they have courses and so on around designing your life okay their design guys is really good okay. but they have a bunch of useful tools and they have this idea of an anchor problem which is something that is kind of holding you down but can be solved by reframing and I don't know where anyway I was just really annoyed uh, you know that I couldn't kind of mm. make progress on a particular thing with a client and I just disremembered this concept or I re or you know yeah, revisited yeah. their material 
And I was ecstatic. I was nearly kind of hopping around the office going, this is exactly the, the way to look at it, yeah. <laughs> you know? So there's stuff like that comes up uh, a lot, mm. um, you know, but that was just one that came from mine because I was doing it yesterday. So Very there you cool. Go. Cool, cool. Favourite saying or cliche that you might use that you actually believe in? Okay, two answers for you here. One is one that I, I share with um, a lot of clients and I do I talk about a lot in talks is a, a the late statistician George Box the English statistician had a great phrase all models are wrong some are useful so a lot of the work that I do or at least my kind of angle on coaching is using these thinking models or mental models this is one way of looking at life one way of looking at the situation one way of looking at the business whatever it is all models are wrong some are useful so it gives you permission to actually look at more than one way of doing it and um, I keep using that my intern cliche is cop the F on <laughs> okay so every here. every time that I uh, I find myself slipping out of focus or whatever I just that's my little phrase cop the F on good now I don't use uh, F right so sure but, you know. sure but that's funny it brings us back to the internal voice probably that's probably giving you the hard time but you have the the positive one to come back oh yeah for sure i know that that's 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 a uh, tough love man i mean that's that's the arm around the shoulder saying you know you know what's important now mm. you know Very. ctfo <laughs> <laughs> um i'll wrap it up just it's 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 the traditional last couple of questions but okay. book recommendations i know you've mentioned a couple and thanks for the book you gave me earlier look forward to reading okay there's a, there's book. so so many so many i always talk about steve pressfield when people ask me about books because in terms of the professional mindset which uh, is that, i think we need is that the art of war is steve yes is the war, of, war okay. of art yeah, yeah sorry the war and, of art. Uh, turning pro um mm. and he has has a series of books now i think he's he's up to six okay. on, on his non-fiction books that are useful for professional people i strongly recommend steve pressfield cool. and a book that i have recommended a lot in the last couple of years is a book that we used in in, in smart rig workshops uh, the year before last which very neatly for me brings allows me to kind of anchor my my uh, path from engineering science to behavioral science and that's a book called how to have a good day mm. by a lady by the name of caroline webb so it's a if you're a kind of nerdy um person which i admit to that loves reading about all this kind of stuff that book is just a bible it's just mm. it, such a collection of behavioral science things about how to improve your day so caroline would be definitely a one percent better person that's around. going on to the shelf i yeah. would imagine um i guess just to maybe wrap it up we we did talk about success and how your you know your 10 years are, are going i suppose what's your what's your ambitions for the next 10 maybe how far, that's a long way away but but just what what's uh what's the future hold hard to know um what i'm working on very much at the minute is kind of doing the kind of work that i enjoy doing um, I've reframed my definition of success to contentment in recent years mm -hmm. and that's not contentment of hiding w within the comfort zone it's it's living life to the full and, and being happy with you know what I'm doing able to to rest the head on the pillow at night satisfied with, with the work that I'm doing and and you know all that tying into everything else that I'm doing and you know the, in life with my family and everything else um I think you'll see a lot more uh, of me I'd say I think you'll see a lot more out there of Smarter Egg. I mm -hmm. think the direction that we, the the project Smarter Egg project is evolved in is very much around the experiential, face to face stuff. You'll see a lot more of the offsite activity. You'll see a lot more of the peer circle stuff. Cool. You'll probably, hopefully, maybe, who knows, see me a little bit out and about more in terms of doing uh, talks and those kind of bits and uh, hopefully we'll get a few more red chairs going as well so you can mm. follow those online and in videos or whatever else so that's the future very good i'm looking forward to to tracking that mm. um so finally just to, to, the, the connecting in with you question or, or to give a shout out how people can find you i'll obviously have all that in the the notes but good to call it out as well yeah uh, smarteregg.com is the the website which will be in the process of evolving slightly at the minute but um if you want to i, I do this lovely um sunday email which mm -hmm. people like mm -hmm. i say lovely 
<laughs> it's a great cool. fun doing cool. it on a Sunday. Um, and you can pop your name in there if you want to get that uh, or I'm on social media aid on in right on, on Twitter primarily hmm. so there that's the way if you want to follow what I'm up to very that's good okay too lots of good stuff coming out uh, in the future aid on I'm looking forward to it as I said and thanks so much for doing this I know uh, it's been in the, the works for a while and I was looking forward to, to picking your brain on certain things so I've definitely a few new ideas to uh, incorporate and hopefully folks get something out of uh, listening as well hopefully brilliant thanks for having me thanks so much so how did you find it a good show hopefully do take a second or two to let me know and before you do dive off just a couple of quick call outs the new podcast the 864 15 minutes long in fact 864 seconds is the aspiration is now out and ready for listening check it out on the site go to the podcast page there's a link for 864 there or go on to apple podcasts and subscribe that would be awesome the 864 is all you have to search for and it's in all other podcast platforms that you can think of or should be so have a listen every week i release a one minute monday video clip which is also a tip to hopefully make you one percent better check that out it's on the website on the video page did you also know that only about one percent of listeners to podcasts not just my own but all leave a rating leave a review get in touch or give feedback and i would love if we could book that trend and put it to two percent for this one so please do take the time to give me a bit of feedback give me some ideas about future guests or whatever the hell comes into mind just get in touch or rate or review the podcast on apple that helps i'm available at all of the social platforms pretty much all at rob of the green that's either with or without the at sign but you'll find it under that moniker so hopefully i'll hear from you there last couple of quick ones support so i do offer some pro bono coaching get onto the website the support page to get in touch few hours a month happy to do that and if you would like to support the podcast that would be awesome you can do so through patreon and also through purchasing books through the book page on the website that goes through amazon and we get a little percentage i'm not even sure what but it's something and finally just to say thanks for taking the time to listen to the podcast i know there's lots of other shows out there it means a lot that you're checking this one out so have a great rest of day week month year whatever it may be and hopefully you're getting one percent better as a result of these shows take care and good luck